All right, I just wanted to put a quick video together to investigate Lab 6 to get you going quick. Um, review the lab handout for a summary, but I wanted this video to step you through some of the more complicated parts um, of using this graphics library. So it's pretty easy to put things on the screen, um, uh, graphics files, and even make your own kind of GUI objects if you don't want to use that touch GFX designer because it seems pretty complicated to integrate. So I'm going to go over the project structure really quick. So I'm going to open up Microvision here. And yeah, let's go to the main file. So in lab six, um, you can read down through the notes. Uh, I took lab five and stripped out a lot of the audio code. And you can add that back in as needed. I just wanted you to see some of the basics of uh, including images with the um, EGFX library. And th there's some notes here. Some of the big notes, and this is a bit of a change from before, is that this project enables what's called a spiffy flash. It's a little flash chip on this board that's external to the microprocessor, but spiffy is kind of neat in that it's a serial interface, but the hardware inside the chip makes it look like as if it was just uh, any other type of memory in the address space. So you can use like good regular old pointers. To, to enable that though, there's a few additions uh, to, to make it work. So I'll scroll down a little bit here. Is there is a function board init uh, spiffy external flash and I copied this over from another project. Uh, you can look at it if you if you want. And what it does, it just gets the, the spiffy controller up and running. Um, that's important because uh, it, it, it won't work if you don't do that. So that was added to board.h. So that, that's a new change since lab five. The other thing is in the pin settings, there's also uh, some settings to enable the spiffy. Um, the spiffy pins. I also, it, there, there's pins in here for the touch controller. Um, the touch controller works over an I squared C bus, so that, that's a change as well. So um, the spiffy, when it's all said and done, that flash is pretty transparent to you. The tools are gonna make it look like it kind of all goes away, um, but it's pretty, uh, it's pretty easy to use. But I just wanna make, make sure you're aware that it, it was there. Um, now to make Spiffy work is that Kyle has to know about it. And one way that the Kyle tool can know about it is uh, through what's called the scatter file. The scatter file, so if we go into the options and go under linker, there is this scatter file that is already selected and the only difference between this and what was in the other projects, it has this junk at the end. And all it does, it says, let's make a new section at these memory addresses where the spiffy controller puts the memory. Um, so it's there. The other addition to this project, if I go under options, debug, settings, flash download. There's another flash programming algorithm that you can add. Um, this project already has it. And it's basically telling the debugger there's this external flash and here's the algorithm to put stuff in there. Because it's not in the chip, it's external to the chip. So that debugger tool has to do a little more work. Now once this is set up, like I said, it's pretty transparent uh, to, to how you're going to um, use everything. So let's go back to main. And you, you can read through the rest of this. Now this project, when you see it, is going to be, you're going to see a little monkey head, and I make a little slider. Now this slider is something uh, that I just made up with a little bit of C code in reading the touch controller. Um, now to use the touch controller, you're going to read down through this code. There is an initialization function that got added. This got pulled in from the touch cursor program from the SDK. So I just uh, massaged it a little bit so it was easy to 
pull in. So you can use this project as an example. Um, now what I'm going to do is before I get into the uh, code that makes the slider, I wanted to show you how bitmaps or PNG files can be brought into the system. Then we're going to look some more at this code. So the slider is going to have a little monkey head for the little nub that you use to move around. If we look in the source folder, egfx, there is a couple things I want to point out here. One is, and these tools have been in the program at all the labs um, since we've started. I just haven't showed them to you. But you want to use the ones in lab six because it enables all the spiffy stuff. The spiffy is important because if you start using really big images, at 16 bits per pixel, the internal flash memory gets used up real quick. Like if you want to make a background image that fits the entire screen, it uses almost half the flash memory. So that spiffy, there's 16 megabytes of it. Um, so it's, it's important to use. Well, there's a program I wrote called EGFX Tools, and it's a command line program. You run it from a DOS prompt. But what it does is you can point it to a folder and say, go in that folder, look at all the images in there, and make a C file with data structures that represent the images. Now, to automate this process, I have a batch file. And all this batch file is, um, it just calls the program, gives it the command. It says, look in this folder called sprites, and here is the color type. That's important because uh, we have to ma have it match the color type of the LCD. So when you run this gen sprites.bat, what it does, it looks in this sprites folder. So let's go in here. And it's going to look for anything that is a PNG image. It has to be PNG. Um, so you can use whatever program you want to make the PNG. And it generates these sprite, um, these uh, sprite C files. These are going to get these get included in the project. So when you want to add more images, all you got to do is drop stuff in there that's a PNG. Like I can just drop this Zelda symbol, which is a PNG file, and run this program. Now this is a big one; it's going to take a little while to convert. Um, so I'll keep talking while it does this. So this program is just going to scan these images and make this really big C file that has everything we need in it. So we'll just let this one go for a sec. Um, I originally wrote this program for fairly small images for fairly small screens, so it's not all that optimized. Um, actually, let me do this really quick because that's just way too big. Oh, let me go open with paint.net. And I'll just resize this to like something small. And this should run quicker. I run this gen sprites. And boy, it just worked really quick. We couldn't even see it. Let me see if I can bring it over here. No, it's, hot, it's going in a different window and it's moving so quick. But what it does, it makes these C files, and we can look at one, that all it does, right, is it makes big arrays that have all this image data in it. It's no big deal. That's all it does. So for you, when you add these to your file, you, you essentially have an H file. And what's nice is that you just get a um, nice symbol that you can use. That's an image plane that we can use the function to copy it. All right, so that's pretty simple. So in, in this gen sprites.bat, um, it has all these commands. It has the egfx tool, which is the exe file, and these extra arguments uh, to control how these sprites are generated. Um, so basically, this is the sprites folder, the color space. And this stuff here is gobbledygook to make sure this gets put on the variable names to make sure the, the spiffy flash is used. Let me get rid of that. Let me run this one more time. 
Now what I'm going to do is go back to my code. It's going to say, yes, the sprites have changed. So what I did is under EGFX, I just make sure that um, the sprites.c file was added so we can see it. This get all, every time we run that program, it'll just get rebuilt. Um, and I'll look at the H file. And it has this special attribute that says where to put it, and that's in spiffy, spiffy flash. But for example, this one here is the sprite that was the folder, the color space, and then the file name. We're going to see that we're going to use that later. Um, and as many images as we want to add in here, we're, we're, we're good to go. Um, and I'll run this, and it should compile, and it's just fine. Now, whenever you want to use these images, and I'll skip down in the program for now to show you the command, there is a function in the library called blit. Blit is an old term from old game programming libraries. It's essentially a memory copy. It means copy a block, a rectangular block of memory from A to B. So everything in this graphics library are image planes. We always write to this back buffer, which is an image plane the same size as our screen. And so what Blit does is the last argument is it just needs a pointer to some source image plane, which is the monkey um, that's in, uh, in our spiffy flash. And we're going to put it onto our back buffer. And then these two lines are just the coordinate. Notice here, it doesn't have to be a fixed coordinate. I can compute a coordinate of where to put it. So we're going to use this to, to make our slider. Um, pretty simple. Now, in terms of our slider, um, you can read down. I'm going to go through this code quick, but I want you to study this a little more in detail. All I do is I kind of do everything manually. What I do is I, I make some symbols called slider region, and I have a start x, a stop x, um, a start y and a stop y that kind of generates is a box, right? It represents a box of what I consider my slider. I started at coordinate 50 comma 150 and then I go to the screen size minus 50 pixels and then the height of the slider is dependent on the size of the sprite. Now this monkey graphic, it's a data structure. When you hit dot, there's a size x and size y that you can use to kind of auto compute things to know how things should be rendered. In this case, I'm going to use it to, to control how big my slider is. So I'll scroll down here. And to make this slider, all I do is I call this get single touch function. You got to pass it a pointer to the x and y coordinate. Um, I noticed their function x and y was re reversed, so I had to reverse it. And basically, you get this variable out of it called touch event. And if there's a continuous contact, you get this constant. All I do is I have like a little if statement that reads the x and y value and see it is it in that box, that region I kind of um, defined. And you can have it checked for multiple regions for multiple sliders. And then I store the x coordinate. And this x coordinate is in screen coordinates. So it's some number between 0 and 480 pixels. The next thing I do is monkey slider position is in screen coordinates. What I do here is if I know the size of that slider region, I can kind of normalize that to a number between 0 and 1. This, this may be useful as if you want to rescale that slider to be like a frequency, say, from 1 to 10 kilohertz um, or something similar. So we, we print out the slider value. Now here, I just render the slider. And you do it kind of like you think. You just make your pieces. So there is a function called draw filled box. It does exactly what it is. And you can look at this function. All it does is draws a set of, uh, a set of horizontal lines. In this case, you ha it just needs a data structure called a box. You make the box. You fill in how big you want the box. And you notice in here, one of my coordinates is dependent on the slider position, what I just read, and then I kind of auto-compute the edges from my uh, macros where I define the slider. Once I draw the box, and I kind of draw it uh, at this color, it's like a blue-gray, 
I call my blit function. What this does is it draws the monkey head. That's kind of like the little nub you grab. You could change this to whatever you want. Um, it's just an example. It's just copying the monkey to the back buffer at an XY coordinate. Then the last thing I do is draw lines. All right, it's simple as that. And the reason I draw these lines, I just want some boundaries to look at. And once you load the program, uh, you'll get to see it. Um, and it, it is pretty slick. Now, one other thing I want to point out here is, is the fonts. Up until now, you've been kind of using fonts I've given you. And there's this one over here, this OCRA extended. Fonts um, are simple to create as well. All they are are a collection of little image planes. And I have a utility. Let me find it here. It's going to lab six, source. EGFX. It's called Font Gen. All we got to do is we have a folder in there called Fonts. We can select the true type name. This just grabs a font from your system. So let's do like Arial. You can select the pixel. Now this isn't the size of the letters. This is the pixel size of the total range that a character could be because there's commas and semicolons all kinds of stuff like that so uh, a size 23 means that the total um, span of the vertical height from your smallest character to your biggest is 23 pixels there's some things to do true type rendering um, and you can play with these this decorator and i have some uh a note in the handout you can add something here is if you want to put things in that spiffy flash there is uh an attribute uh you don't have to um the fonts aren't quite as big unless you make them really really big like 100 pixels big then uh it's going to use a lot of flash memory so you can put that special attribute um in there and it's actually is this guy here and you can copy it from you can copy it from the uh, other examples there's an example in the in the lab handout but the only thing I want to show you once you get this all set up you just say build true type font and it kind of gives you a preview over here but if we come in fonts it makes a folder called Arial 23 px what, what all my settings are and there's just some a C and an H file well, once that's generated, you can just add it to your project, right? Here I have Consolas, Magneto. These are just other fonts I just added to the project. The only thing you got to make sure of is it's in here. Actually, let me go to the right spot. Is that in your include paths, you got to make sure the path to that font folder is in your include path so you see it. Uh, once you do that, all you got to do is include the H file, and you can kind of look at the example. Now, the in here, for example, I'm using the OCRA extended. Down here, I'm using the Magneto. The names are really big because they have all that information about um, how the font was generated. But this will give you an example if you want to kind of play around with that. So, um, so there you go. Uh, it, it's actually not that bad once you learn how to bring in images and read that touch cursor or I'm sorry, that touch screen, to kind of make your own little widgets. Um, and you can kind of get as complicated as you want. All right, let's take a quick look at the actual um, slider. So let me load this, and I'll be right back. All right, so I downloaded the program here, and you can see a little monkey. Sorry for the recording. It's hard to capture the screen on the, the camera. So I'm just going to put this on here, and uh, you can see there it is. So on, the pro, uh, on this program, the topmost line shows the actual last touch coordinate. The slider value is this normalized value that we compute um, based upon where we're at. And there you go. And you can see I can move the head back and forth, and I kind of got a little slider bar. So it's really just putting together a few of these, um, the, the, these graphics functions, and you can kind of extend this as far as you, uh, as far as you want to.